Hello and welcome to Malware Analysis for Hedgehogs. I'm finally back from vacation and Malware Hunter team has pointed me to an interesting sample that I um, indeed uh, think is worth making a video. Although it's another .NET unpacking tutorial, it's uh, there are some new techniques involved which I didn't show in my other videos yet. Alright, um, let's take a look at this sample first. Um, there's a debug path in this sample and it's it's indeed a .NET file, you can see this here. And the debug path is interesting because Visual Studio will um, put this path there uh, by default, so if you as if a developer doesn't change it, it will expose the username, for instance, um, that's been used on the development uh, computer. And there's also, um, also the name of the project that has been used. In this case, it's a standard name. That's Windows application and a number. So that's um, if you click on Visual Studio on the new project button, this will be created with the number behind it. So it's the fourth standard project that this um, developer did. Um, to me, it's an indication that the project wasn't very important to the developer because otherwise they would have given it a proper name and um, not that. All right. Um, Checking the strings will also show the, the path again. And there's this ahmed.exe, which I think is worth um, to look at later. And lots of lots of base 64 strings. Now, um, I assume that PE Studio has an upper limit for the size of the strings because um, that's actually just one string, uh, as you will see later. Okay, let's check the code in a decompiler. And here it is. Now, as soon as, um, obviously, I clicked at the main because that's where code execution starts. But as soon as you see a set of this, as my computer, my project, my settings, and so on, um, you may want to check the form one first. Um, that's a form application. That means uh, a lot of the code that's here has been generated by Visual Studio. And that's nothing you're interested in. So you look at the form first, that's the user code, the code of the developer. And well, here's a lot of junk right there. Um, so the more interesting m methods to look at are the form load and initialize component method. So I will still scroll a bit through. You see that's nothing um nothing interesting here and here's the form load and that's uh, interesting code um there is our amit.exe it's a file in the temp directory and uh what's written to is it is a base64 string so there we have the base64 string now we just need to find the string so we can decode it ourselves um, in this case, that's the easiest way. Uh, okay. Of course, you can also execute the file and then um, get the armor.exe and then you also have the, the dropped file. And obviously, it's a dropper. It writes it to disk and um, so it's a dropper. What did I want to do? I wanted to check the resources. Um, Oh, these buttons are too many. <laughs> All right, uh, here's a text file one resource, right? and now we can save this with the button here. Save, and here we have it. Open it with Notepad, and then you might want to remove the header of the resource. We don't need it anymore. 
and just decode the base64 string, save it to the file, and then you might want to recheck what you got here. Okay, um, again a .NET file, nice, and it has an internal name and original file name is server.exe. That's a huge sign to me that this is a remote access Trojan um, because they call um, the part that's on the victim's computer server and the client is the part that's on the attacker's computer. So um, it all right, uh, it uses reflection and uh, load load module, so it's um, it seems it's loading something dynamically, and we need to check that. Um, Alright, uh, at this point you can see that this is uh, obfuscated by Confuser. And Confuser is one, one of the more difficult obfuscators, uh, but um, we will be able to tackle that nevertheless. And here you can see the load module call, um, which is interesting for us and also an invoke, but I, uh, at this point you should be able to um, dump this array here and that's what we want to do. It gets something from the resources and then reads it and into this array and then loads uh, it here. Um, here's the array. So uh, the best way to get this is using the NSPY. And We will just do that. All right. Um, you need to take the right version for debugging. If it's um, a 64-bit application, you need the nspy.exe. Otherwise, you need the um, 86.exe. Um, run it as administrator. All right. And we get the error. So okay, we open up um, the debugging. There it is. Now you might ask why I do not uh, deobfuscate the confuser right here because uh, it's not necessary. I, the important parts are readable right here, so. Um, that's what I will do. Um, okay, I clicked on here. That was the interesting part. We want to dump this array. I will set a breakpoint here and press continue. And there we have our array. Let's see what's in there. Yeah, nothing useful yet. And we will step once and then, yes please, and here it's been um, decoded or decrypted or whatever. Uh, I guess this function is decrypting the array and that's um, here the MMZ. So we have probably a executable or, well, a portable executable at least. So um, take a look in the memory window, all right. Now you can right click and say save selection to the desktop. That's our first dump and save that. Okay, no need to check this. Here it is. Um, okay, the first dump. Now that's interesting right here, that's a net module and um, it's interesting in so far as uh, if you want to debug this dump 
you need to make it runnable first. And that module is not runnable on its own. Um, the smallest runnable uh, thing in, in .NET executables is the assembly. And the assembly has a manifest uh, that is necessary to, to make it run. The .NET module does not have this manifest, and it's only meant to be used in context of an assembly. So, but uh, the NSPY is able to create an uh, um, assembly out of the net module. So, in case you want to to use uh, debugging to unpack this, um, open up the NSPY, and that's our new thing that we do. Right, uh, we learn right right here. Um, yeah. So we open the dump. Where is it? There. Now you can also see it's named net module, and you can right click on it and you can say convert to assembly. Do that, and then say save all, and I would save it to like um, modified. That's the modified dump. Right. And um, if you do not do that, well, let me just open up Process Explorer to check if that's all right. No, just that half. Um, okay, um, that's the unmodified file. And uh, this shouldn't work. Yeah. It's not a well Win32 application. And I will show you soon the reason. Um, I think the same should happen here. The, um, this one still should not run, and I'm just verifying this uh, by looking at Process Explorer. And again, it does not run, although we added or we made an assembly out of it. So what's the problem? Now you need to open this um, with CFF Explorer. That's also a viewer for PE um, relevant related metadata, but um, you can also edit the metadata and. Um, there's one thing here that's wrong, that's um, this, the file is a DL, just uncheck this, it's not a DL, you want an executable and uh, not a dynamic link library. And the other thing is, if it's a forms application, like, like our first file we had, you might want to uh, change this um, to to Windows uh, graphical user interface instead of this. So but we don't need that um, here for alpha. Yes, save the changes. Yes, that's okay. And now we need to be a bit careful. It's now able to run and infect our machine. All right. Um, so, but let's take a look at it. Um, again with the inspy. Now in this case um, that was the file, yeah it's the old one but doesn't matter. Um, you can already see if you click on the entry point that this is really a mess. You don't want to analyze this code, right? Um, well if you if there's no possibility to deobfuscate it, um, that's when you can can use um, this to make it runnable, run it, and then use Megadumper to dump what's inside. Um, but in this case, it's not necessary. We can uh, deobfuscate it with no fuser. But it doesn't work every time, so you might. Um, you might want, you always uh, have to keep in mind several ways of achieving what you want to achieve. And um, in this case, I think it's it's quite good to check this and then 
I will just rename it to cleaned, cleaned, uh, clean dump one. Yes, please change it. Oh, we have it all here. And we will open the cleaned dump. Huh. The the deobfuscated one and that looks much better already um, and now if you analyze the code now you can see that this um, is opening a zip file um, an archive and uh, this archive is uh, loaded into memory so we want what's inside this archive and um, Oh, let's check the method that's using it. I think it's this one. So it's... Wow. <laughs> wow, it's doing some stuff here. Uh, ah, here. Okay, this method gets um, the archive from the resource stream. So again, it's in the resources and that's where you will find the archive. You can just save it from here. You don't need uh, to debug this code. Now just extract this. Okay, that's not important here. You can check this nevertheless, but no, not important. But this one is, it's again called server.exe. Um, I would say it's dump2. Dump2. Yes. And. Alright. Take a look at it. So, uh, the entry point is JA main. Interesting. And now uh, it has some ugly method name, so that's that's really not so nice. Uh, if you do not want to hurt your eyes with ugly method names, use defodot. Defodot has a list of uh, several obfuscators it can uh, deobfuscate successfully, but even if it doesn't know the obfuscator, it will at least rename the method name, so just try it if it looks ugly. And here's our clean dump, and now we may analyze this instead, so... Okay, yeah, that's better. We... Oh, wow, wow. And we are at the end. That's the actual malware file. And well, I just clicked, you know, I, I got into the method that was called from the main and I usually then click on the class to see the other method and methods in, the, in that class. Uh, mostly to get an overview. Like, um, And here we have what's the most interesting part usually if you have a remote access Trojan that's the configuration file and um, because there you can uh, see what um, where where it's connecting to which um, port and and so on and where it also saves the um, or copies the executable to and into which locations and here's a version number that's the version number of NJRED. NJRED is our uh, malware file. Um, if you upload this to um, VirusTotal, you will probably get the malware name SplatterBD. That's the name for NJRED. Um, it's bad practice to use the name that it that the author intended it to have, so they named it SplatterBD. And also other files that uh, copied 
source code from NJRED might be detected by Vladabindi because uh, uh, detection might be based on that source piece that they have copied. So um, nowadays, yeah, Vladabindi is basically a detection name for lots of um, well remote access tools. And yeah, again, you might um, now want to check the source, what it can do. There's some keyboard logging right here. You see the get keyboard state and so on. And, um, KL probably also stands for keyboard logging. Um, there, that's how it indicates the uh, certain keys in the log file and here are other keys. So, yeah, that's quite interesting. I will leave it to you to analyze this and unpack it yourself. Yeah. Um, many thanks to Malverhand team because um, they explained to me uh, how to tackle this with the net module, basically how to make the net module executable. And um, I, yeah, I learned, I learned something new today and um, I love to share this with you. So thank Hunter if you learned something here. I will link um, Hunter team's Twitter profile also in the description below. And thanks for watching. See you next time.